Okay, in our final projectile motion video, we're going to look at the effect of launch angle, uh, look at the effect of air resistance, and also, um, I guess, also look at the effect of launch height, um, with a particular emphasis on the projectiles that we might use in sport. So firstly, let's think about launch angle. What do we need to be able to do? For a projectile launched from ground height, fine by using sample calculations or otherwise, the launch angle that results in the maximum range and the relationship between launch angles that result in the same range. Firstly, the sample calculations, you can do it using the sort of mathematical way that we've already um, looked at and by changing that initial velocity and particularly changing, so keeping the magnitude of the initial velocity the same but changing the launch angle and you could do lots of calculations a spreadsheet will help with something like that and work it out um, and we might talk about that in class if people are keen but I'm not going to say too much about that now the or otherwise is much more fun I think most of you will probably have in your labs a projectile launcher so I would encourage you to get that projectile launcher out shoot some marbles around your lab have some fun See if you can work out which angle gives you the maximum range. It's not that hard to work out, but it's still fun trying to find out and check you're correct. Um, another really easy way to do it is just with a hose. If you get a hose, squirt water through a hose, keep the pressure constant, and then change the angle of that hose, look at how far the water goes. You can use, take some video, get a really good result really simply. If it's a hot day, particularly if you're at Roxby Downs, that might be a good experiment to go out inside and do. Just don't squirt the wrong person and get in trouble. Thirdly, um, and I'm going to refer to these a little bit this year, if you go and look at a website called FET, they have lots and lots of simulations. And up here is the link to their projectile motion simulation. And I would encourage you to go online, go to the FET website, find the projectile motion um, simulation and have a go at putting in different launch angles and testing out how it affects the range. So I guess that final way is the simulation. Now, sorry to spoil the surprise at the end, but hopefully you will find that we get a maximum range at when the launch angle is 45 degrees. So that gives us our maximum balance of time of flight and horizontal velocity. If we come above 45 degrees, we do get more time of, time of flight, but we lose horizontal the horizontal component of the velocity, so we lose range. If we go below 45, we have a greater horizontal velocity, but we lose time of flight. So that leads us to the launch angles that result in the same range. And the launch angles that result in the same range, uh, let me just change colour rather than writing that out, are essentially theta and 90 minus theta. So that means at 10 degrees, you will get the same range as at 80 degrees. At 20 degrees, you will get the same angle as 70 degrees. At 30, you will get the same as at 60. So don't just take my word for that. Have a play with your projectile launchers or your hose or the simulation and check that I'm not feeding you some BS and that you do get a maximum range at 45 degrees and you do see this relationship between the launch angles that result in the same range. Okay, let's talk about the effect of air resistance. Um, I probably should have more of my notes here, so I've added some notes already to this slide before I start just to speed it up a bit. So firstly, let's sort of think about the forces acting on our projectile as we um, like we looked at before when we ignored air resistance. Air resistance always acts in the opposite direction to the velocity. So it's in the opposite direction to the velocity vector. It talks about that up here. Um, so 
not only now do we have the air resistance, sorry, not only do we have gravity acting, we also have air resistance. Now, when the, when the projectile is on its way up, air resistance has a vertical component that's downwards, as well as a horizontal component acting in the opposite direction of the motion of the projectile. And however, when the projectile starts to go down, the horizontal component still acts in the opposite direction to the velocity. However, the vertical component now counteracts gravity. So it acts in the opposite direction to gravity, whereas before the vertical component of air resistance acted downwards in the same direction as gravity. So what does this mean? These two lines here show the path of two projectiles, one with air resistance, one where we ignore air resistance. The first thing, the horizontal component of the velocity is always decreasing due to air resistance, therefore the range is decreased, and we can see that decrease in the range there. Secondly, on the upward path, so up to here, on the upward path, the vertical velocity decreases at a faster rate due to air resistance because it's acting in the same direction as gravity or the vertical component is therefore the time of flight will decrease and the maximum height so we see it reaches the maximum height sooner than here and that maximum height is less however when the projectile starts heading down so on the downwards path air resistances air resistance opposes gravity therefore increases, therefore gravity, therefore the velocity, I should say, increases at a slower rate. So it doesn't fall as fast as it would if it was just gravity and there was no air resistance. Big air resistance is actually somewhat pushing up on the projectile. So therefore that increases the time of flight on the downward path. So overall, if the landing height equals the launch height though, the time of flight will be decreased. You lose more time here than you gain on the way down. Um, sorry, that hopefully is clear. If you've got any questions, make sure you sing out. It's a little bit confusing, and I probably could have set out my notes with a bit more space to show that. Okay, the second thing we need to know about air resistance is compare qualitatively the forces of air resistance acting on different objects. And the first thing is speed. Um, the greater the speed of an object, the greater the air resistance. So if you're driving along in your car and you hold your hand out the window, that's air resistance that's pushing back on your hand. The greater, the faster you're going, the greater that air resistance. Second thing is cross-sectional area. The larger the cross-sectional area, the larger the air resistance. So Oh, this diagram is very much not drawn to scale, but let's say if we had a golf ball and then we had a basketball, the basketball has a greater, it's a bigger ball, it has a greater cross-sectional area, so it would experience much more air resistance than a golf ball. The air density also affects air resistance. The greater the air density, the greater the air resistance. So I know from playing golf, um, where they play golf at high altitude, where the air density is less, people can hit the golf ball much, much further. I know when I lived up in the Ernabella in the APY lands, where you're about 600 metres above sea level, I always felt I could hit a golf ball further than I could down at sea level. Um, texture. Um, sorry, back to air density. It's also a good reason to play golf in a thunderstorm, because that's when the air pressure is usually the lowest, so you can hit the ball furthest. Only problem is you might get hit by lightning, so it's not the safest way to do it. Um, texture is also important. Air flows better over a slightly rough surface than a smooth surface. So a golf ball has dimples because it will fly further than a smooth ball because the dimples actually aid airflow over the ball. However, if you get to a very rough ball, like a tennis ball, that surface is so rough that it actually slows the air down flowing over the surface. So in that case, a very rough surface will increase. If you're into um, swing bowling in cricket, there's some really interesting stuff because, in a sense, conventional swing is a slightly rough surface 
when they talk about a ball going reverse, it becomes like the tennis ball effect with a very rough surface. Um, shape also has a big effect. Some shapes are obviously more aerodynamic than others. So if we compare a combi van to a Ferrari, the Ferrari is a much more aerodynamic shape. It'll cut through the air much better, or have a lower, um, less aerodynamic drag, and um, so therefore it will, cover, it will experience less air resistance. So now we're going to look at really the effect of launch height. Um, in the subject outline it talks about this being an application and projectiles in sport and it uses the shot put as the example. But firstly, this diagram here looks at, well, here we have launch height equals landing height. Here the launch height is increased and launch height is increased further. So as we increase this launch height, we can see that our range increases, which I think probably seems like common sense. So why is that happening? As the launch height increases, the range increases, we've just said that, because the greater the time, we, each case we have greater time on the downward path, therefore more time where the horizontal velocity is acting. So because we've launched higher than landing height, we've got this greater time that it can fall, so that's increasing our time of flight, the horizontal component is still acting during this time, so that increases our range. And here, as we even increase the launch height more, that increases further. Secondly, it gets a little bit more confusing here when we think about the maximum range. So before we said the maximum range, if we were launching at the same height as landing, 45 degrees would be the maximum. So if this one was 45 degrees, maximum range, if we decrease the launch angle, we'd obviously get less range. We'd just be going through to here on this graph. However, if we're launching higher than we're landing, we've got this increased time on the downward path where the horizontal velocity is acting. So, what does we say here? When the launch height is greater than the landing height, the maximum range is at a launch angle of 45 degrees. If the launch height is equal to the landing height, lowering the launch angle below 45 will decrease the vertical velocity, therefore decrease the time of flight and therefore the range. Lowering the launch angle will increase the horizontal velocity though. When the launch height is greater than the landing height, the time of flight on the downward trajectory is increased, and the benefit of an increased horizontal velocity in increasing range outweighs any range lost due to slightly less overall time of flight due to the decrease in the vertical velocity. So what we're really saying is, in this case here, with the lower launch angle, yes, the time of flight would be less than this other case. However, because the horizontal velocity will be greater, that will outweigh any loss we experience there. It's a little bit confusing that. You might have to have a read through that a couple of times to get your head around that. And it, that is, if you like, the hard bit at the end, but, but see how you go. Um, the next part really talks about air resistance on projectiles in sport, and I really covered that last in the last slide when we talked about air resistance. So hopefully that made sense. So that's it for the videos on projectile motion. You should now be able to work through all the questions at the end of chapter one in your workbook dealing with projectile motion. I will also provide you with some extra former test and exam questions if you would like some extra challenges. Thanks.